So as I mentioned earlier, you know, what I'm preaching on this morning is this concept of cheap grace. There's a, there's a false doctrine out there that, that refers to what we believe in as far as salvation goes. They refer to that as cheap grace. Now, I want to start off just posing a question to you, and I want you to fit, just, just think about this for, for just a second. And, and how much would you value eternal life? What kind of a, of a price tag can you put on an eternity in heaven with the Lord. And, and we, know, we know the Bible talks about two places that we can end up after we die. We know that the Bible talks about a burning, fiery furnace of hell, which is a, which is a terrible place, obviously. I mean, it, that goes without saying. And then, and then a wonderful place of heaven where you know, we're going to be getting new bodies and the, the pain and the sorrow and, and, and all the things that, that we have to deal with in this lifetime physically here are all going to be done away. No pain, no sorrow, joy, light, gladness, happiness with the Lord. How can you put a price tag on such a thing? It's without measure. And yet God has given that gift to us by His grace. And I'm going to show you this morning from the Scripture what the Bible teaches about God's grace and what grace even is. And this whole concept of cheap grace is, is actually it's, it's a very serious heresy that, that is being taught. And, and the, the term itself doesn't even make any sense. Grace is free. It's not cheap. It's free. Grace is something that's given to you. Grace is something that is undeserved, but it's just given to you anyways. When my children have a birthday or Christmas time or any other time for that matter during the year, when we decide to give them a gift, that's grace. It's not because they're earning it. Now, sometimes they'll do things and I'll give them a reward. That's not grace. That's a payment. That's, that's giving them, hey, this is a good job. You did a good job. You know, I told you to clean up your room and here's what you're going to get because you did this work. That's not grace. Grace is something that is given freely. Just, you know what? We love you. We're going we're to take you on this trip. We're going to take you to this place. We're going to do this for you. We're going to get you some ice cream just because we love you. That's grace. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, this is, this is a passage you can see. I even have it highlighted in my Bible because I like when, when we preach the gospel to people, this is a, a, a section of scripture I like to go to frequently because of how clear it is about how we get saved. Now, we're going to start off, let's, let's go back looking at verse number one. We're going to try to get this more in context. I know we read this, um, the whole chapter. We're going to review it real quickly here. And let, well, before we get into this, I just want to explain what, what, what am I preaching against? Okay, this concept of cheap grace. I didn't really give you a good, if you're not familiar with it, what cheap grace is, what, what people will say, you know, what we believe about being saved completely by grace, it's a free gift. All you have to do is put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to receive it. There is a, there's a crowd out there, and, and these days they, they kind of fall under a, a lordship salvation is what you would call it. And what they believe is that, well, you can't just have grace. I mean, you've got to have the discipleship. You've got to have the, you know, the works. You've got to go and do all these other things. I mean, you can't just say, well, yeah, you know, I'm going to receive this free gift from Christ and then, and then live however you want. Now, look, I'm not for that of just, of just being just completely um, despising God's word and, and going out and just living a life of sin. That's not what we teach and are about doing that. However... For people to say, well, if you don't make Jesus the Lord of your life and are willing to do whatever it is that he says and willing to obey every single command, then you can't be saved. That's a false doctrine. And that's heresy because now you're adding works and you say, oh, well, how, many, how much of the law do you have to follow? Because I, I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody who's perfect. I don't know anybody who follows God's laws to a team and just every single thing. But then it's because then it's going to start to cause doubt. Well, you know, I sinned. Does that mean that, that I'm not really saved? Does that mean that, that I didn't really appreciate the gift that God's given me? And here's the thing. There's a difference between receiving a gift and being appreciative of that gift. 
They're two different things. You can receive a gift and it can be yours and you can own it and it can belong to you without you ever being appreciative of that gift. And what the cheap grace crowd will do is they'll say, oh yeah, so that means you can just go out and do whatever you want. And you know, people have a hard time with this. When I go through and I'll explain the gospel and say, look, Christ paid for all of your sins when he died on that cross. Every single one, past, present, and future. He died for our sins before we were even born. I mean, this, this was like 2,000 years ago. So how was it that he was able to pay for future sins? But some people will say, well, only the moment you believe, then it's just your past sins that are, that are forgiven. No, that doesn't even make any sense because he paid for them well before we were born. He paid for sins going all the way out into the future. And once you accept that payment, they are covered. They're paid for. It's done. It's secure. It's a done deal. And it's given to you for free. And people will hear that and, and they'll start to think about it. And they'll say, well, wait a minute. Then that means that you can still go out and sin and you're still saved. Yes, that's what that means. Absolutely. Because we're still going to sin. And he paid the price for us one time. He did, we don't need to keep putting him on the cross over and over and over again every time we sin and, and put him to an open shame. He's paid that price for us one time. Now, as I mentioned the value of eternal life, shouldn't we be appreciative of that gift? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's the greatest thing in the world. And, you know, we all would probably want to strive and work for that and do whatever we can to get it. And to have it just given to you for free is amazing. And that's what God has done. So we ought to be, we ought to be, thankful. We ought to be able to, Sarah, be quiet and sit still. We ought to be thankful. We ought to be able to, to live according to the way God wants us to just because he's given us such a great gift. That's, that should be something that comes from our heart, but that doesn't cheapen what God did for us in any way, shape, or form just because we have the ability to sin and still be covered by his grace and still be, and still be saved from our sins. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to go through this a little bit. Um, ver look at verse number 1. It says, And you hath he quickened. Quickened means you were made alive. It's just an old word, meaning you, know, you brought back to life. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. See, when we sin, before, before you receive Christ as your sinner, the first time you sin, that's when your spirit dies. Just as, as Adam, you know, in the day, the, God said, the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. And he did die. Now, did he die physically? No. But he, his spirit died in that day. And the same thing with all of us. When we get to that age where we could understand right from wrong and we know good from evil and we choose and we sin against God, our spirit dies. And that's why we need to be born again. That's why we need to be born of the Spirit. And he says, you hath he quickened. He's made you alive. You were dead in trespasses and sins. But he's made you alive again. Verse number two, wherein in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, just as everybody does, by the way. We walk, we grow up, we walk in the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. See, the Satan is literally the god of this world. He is the one that, that's, that's doing, you know, behind all the, you know, the, the powers and, and high places and, and, and workings of evil in this world. He's allowed to do that stuff right now. I mean, Jesus Christ is going to come back one day and he's going to set up his kingdom and he's going to sit on the throne and the devil is not going to be around to cause any of the trouble he's doing now. But right now he is doing that. And God is allowing that to happen. And the devil now has a lot of power on this earth and he's going around. It says we're in time past. You walked according to the course of this world. And when it talks about the prince of the power of the air, it's talking about Satan. Because that spirit now worketh in the children of disobedience. Verse number three, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. It's human, we have a sinful nature. It's human nature to sin. It's human nature to do this stuff and go the way of the world. That's why the Bible says, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. We all go down that path. The end of that path is destruction, but there's a way out. And thank the Lord for that. He says in verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, 
for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. And there it is in, in those parentheses. By grace ye are saved. He's made you alive again through Christ because it's by His grace. Because of His abundant mercy and how much He loves us. By grace ye are saved. Verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding, good, exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And these are the verses I love showing people out soul winning. Verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So he's saying here, it's by grace that you're saved through faith. It's God's grace that even allows you to get saved. Because He loves you and He's given you a free gift. And the way you receive that, that's why it says through faith. The way you receive God's grace is through faith. When you put your trust on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you rely on Him to save you alone and stop trusting your own good works, stop trusting your good deeds, stop trusting in your church attendance, stop trusting in, in how many good things you've done for people, stop trusting in, in how well you obey the Ten Commandments, you stop trusting in that as your righteousness in order to go to heaven and you trust solely on the Lord Jesus Christ and His shed blood for you, that is the moment when you are saved. And that is the grace that is bestowed upon you that through that faith you receive God's grace. And he says, it's that not of yourselves. It's not based on what you do. It's not on those things. It's the gift of God. And this is a great point. When you're trying to explain the gospel to someone, great verses because he's saying here, it's a gift. Everybody knows what a gift is. And I love using this example, especially with younger children. I would say, who loves getting gifts? Well, Everyone loves getting gifts. Why not, right? I mean, hey, someone's giving you something for free. Of course, it's great. Why wouldn't you like to get a gift? Everyone likes getting it. And inherently, if you're going to call something a gift, you can't pay for it. If I were to offer you, and I'll just go through real quickly an illustration that we use out soul winning. You know, if I say, if I were to give you this, this Bible as a gift, but then said, you've got to give me a penny. Now, that might be a great deal. It would be a $50 Bible. And I said, you just got to give me a penny and it's yours. Is that a gift? No. Great deal, but it's not a gift. If, you have to, if, you, if I have to shell something out to you, no matter what the value of that is, it's still, you're still performing a transaction and you're purchasing it. It's not a gift. Or if I were to say, you know what? You don't have to give me any money. I'm not asking for that. I'll give this to you, but first you just have to go and wash my car. Make it clean. Nice, you know... I don't want to see any, any dirt or dust on there. Get that clean, and this is yours. Still not a gift. Why? Because you're working for it. I mean, it's like a paycheck. You know, at, the end, at the end of my work week, my boss doesn't say, hey, hey, Dave, here's a, here's a gift for you. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not a gift. You know, if he wants to give me a gift, great. But when I put in my hours and I work for him, I'm earning my money. That's something that's actually owed to me. If he were not to pay me my paycheck at the end of the week after I've done work for him, he's at fault because he owes me that money and I could literally sue him and, and try to get my money back because it's something that I deserve because I've worked for it and I've earned it. Grace is not that. Grace is the exact opposite. Grace is something that's just free. A gift is something that's given to you for free. No strings attached, no... You know, it's not like, you know, we, we bring this up sometimes too. Say, okay, I want to give you this Bible as a gift. But what happens if I come back a year later and I notice it's all dusty, you haven't done anything with it, you know, and I say, you know what, give, give me that Bible back. You're not even using it for anything. Would that be right? To just take it away from them after I've already given it to them? No. Now, I might have given it to them as a gift, but if I come and, and take it away from them, now I'm stealing it from them. Just because they don't do things with it the way that I want them to do, to do it doesn't mean I have control over the gift I've given to them. It's their gift. If it's truly a gift, it belongs to them. It's no, I have no longer any say over what they do with that gift. And if our salvation truly is a gift, you could say, yeah, but they're not doing anything with it. They're not telling anybody about it. They're not reading their Bible. They're not doing what God wants them to do. Hey, is it a gift or is it not? Did God give it to you for free? Or is he put it on with restrictions and say, well, now, now uh, it's free, but if you're not going to church, if you're not reading, if you're not singing, if you're not doing these things, then I'm just going to take it away from you. 
Is that really a gift? No. That's not a gift. We'll see. We're going to go through a lot more scripture. I told you we've got a lot of scripture to go through. Now, I've had people every once in a while will say, well, keep reading. Because we read, read Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not based on our good works, the, the, our obedience to the law, the works in accordance with the law. We could brag about that. We get the credit for our obedience. We get the credit for our works and the good things that we do. But the salvation that we receive is not credited to us in any way, shape, or form. It's credited to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who suffered. He's the one who bled. He's the one who died and rose again from the grave. And he gets all the glory. You can't take glory for something that's just you just received for free. That has nothing to do with you. All the credit goes to the person giving you that gift. Jesus Christ gets all that glory. But let's keep reading. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. People say, see, well, what about that? He said, you know, we're created unto good works. Amen. We are. We're created unto good works. God wants us to take our salvation. God wants us to do good works for him. It's all throughout the Bible. That's what he wants us to do. But notice the wording. That we should walk in them. You know, there's a verse in the Bible in Acts chapter 16 where a man asked a question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Key difference between must and should. We should walk in newness of life. We should do what's right. We should go to church. We should read our Bible. We should help other people out. We should put other people before us. We should do all the things that the Bible tells us to do, but it does not say that if you don't do those things, that God is going to take away your eternal life. That God is going to take away your eternal salvation. And again, the, you know, people get, get all uptight about this. Oh, well, you can't just say that to people because then they'll just go out and sin. Well, look, this is what I believe, and I'm not just going out and getting rampant in sin. It's a choice. See, what, what we want to do is love God because he did this for us. We love him because he first loved us. And he's given us this great gift. But it doesn't mean that just because you can do something that you'll do it. You know, you know, there's a lot of other things. I don't want to get too political. You know, people get all freaked out like, oh, if we were to make drugs legal, then everybody's going to be doing heroin. Like, who here, if, if heroin was legal today, who's going to go out and just start shooting up? <laughs> just because something's available to you doesn't mean you're going to do it. And that's the point, right? Just because that, that, that's an option. Just like with our salvation, just because, yes, you can sin and you're still saved, doesn't mean that you're just going to go out and just do every sin under the sun because, hey, I'm saved, why not? Let's turn to uh, Romans chapter 11, if you would, please. Romans chapter 11. If you got the New Testament, you got the first four Gospels, the book of Acts, and then the book of Romans. Romans 11. We're going to see a little bit more about grace. Romans 11 has a great passage regarding just kind of defining grace and how it separates works from grace completely. The two don't mix. They can't mix. They're, they're completely separate. And, and once you, it's either one or the other. You can't have a blend of the two. As soon as you start blending grace with works, it's works. Because it's, because it's no longer grace. Grace is, has to be completely on its own. But we're going to see this from the Bible. The Bible's definition, Romans 11. Look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, Even so then at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Now, it could be a little bit of a tongue twister, and the way that it's worded might be a little bit difficult to understand. We read it slowly, though, and, and really all it's trying to say is that if it's, if it's grace, it cannot be works because they're separate. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. As soon as you introduce works, that is not grace anymore. And this is what, in, in, in this day, the big thing was circumcision. They're trying to say, well, you know, believing isn't enough. You also have to be circumcised. You also have to do something else according to Moses' law. 
And he's saying, no, 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 no. That's a work of the law. That is something that, that you're obeying in accordance to the law. He says, as soon as you start adding works to grace, he's saying it, it's completely by grace. As soon as you add something to that, that's no longer grace. It's, it's something else. It, it's, it's, a different, it's a different thing. It's not grace. Grace has to be completely without works. But if it be of works, and now he goes from the other side, the other angle. Well, if, it's, if you're working for it, it's no more grace. Because then how can you call that work? How can you say, I'm working for it if you're getting something for free, if you're getting something for nothing? How is that work? So he's saying they're, they're completely separate from each other. Works and grace. Flip back, if you would, to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, just a few chapters uh, previous. People want to call it what we believe cheap grace. How can grace be cheap? It's free. There's no price. You're not saying, oh yeah, that cheap grace. Yeah, we believe in this grace that, that costs a dollar. That's cheap grace. No, it costs nothing. <laughs> Zero. It's free. That's what grace is. It, you know, if, you, if you add a price tag to it, then it's no longer grace. And this is one of the reasons why I believe their term doesn't even make sense. They'll use this term. They'll, and they'll, they'll, they'll try to use it to ridicule what we believe and mock us. And you know, they'll say, oh, you easy believism people as, as another derogatory, derogatory word. Hey, I don't think it's derogatory. Yes, I think it's easy to get saved. And I think it's just through believing on the Lord Jesus Christ because that's what the Bible says. That is easy believism. And that's what I believe wholeheartedly because it's grace. It's free. It is, it is of no charge to us. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It doesn't say for God so loved the world that we have to give our life to Christ that we might have everlasting life. It doesn't say that. He's the one who did the giving. We do the receiving. We receive the free gift. The gift that was given was Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross. He gave everything. Now, should we be willing to offer up ourselves a living sacrifice? Absolutely. Should we be willing to give of ourselves and to do whatever it is that God wants us to do? Yes. But is that salvation? Is salvation tied up in us giving up our whole life to serve God? Think about that. Giving up your life to serve God, that sounds like work to me. If our eternal life, it's by grace. It's not of works as any man should boast. So again, it, it, you know, it's, with salvation, we have to completely separate what is salvation and then what should we do? What are good things for us to do? The good things for us to do is, is everything lined up in the Bible and all the good works to do, but that is not salvation. Salvation is separate. Um, we're in Romans 4. Let's start reading in verse number 1. Because salvation has always been by grace through faith. Always. I don't care going back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and going all the way into the future. You know, I don't believe in, in these dispensations where people were saved at different ways and different times and sometimes you have to be baptized and sometimes you have to obey the law and sometimes you have to do all these other things. Look, Romans 4 is very clear about this. It talks about Abraham. It talks about David. You know, Abraham is before the law of Moses. And David is during the time of the law of Moses. And in Romans 4, we're going to see righteousness is given to them all based on their faith. Let's look at verse number 1. The Bible says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works... He hath whereof to glory. Doesn't that sound very familiar to what we just read in Ephesians 2? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. So instead of boast, it says he has whereof to glory. If it was based on his works, he can glory in that. He can boast in that. It's by grace. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. He may be able to glory before other men, but not before God. God knows he's a sinner. God knows he's not perfect. God knows he has flaws. Verse number three, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt, as I was alluded to earlier. The things that I work for when I'm getting payment for that, that's the debt that's owed to me because I've worked for it. Verse number five, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. This is what God looks at for our salvation, is the faith. Did you have faith in Christ? 
And this is, there's another scripture I've highlighted in my Bible because I show people, they'll say, oh, but you can't just go out and do this. Look, this verse literally says, but to him that worketh not. We're talking about someone who does no good works. To him that worketh not. Someone doing no good works, but they believe. But believeth on him that, that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus Christ gets imputed unto you the moment you put your faith in him. You receive his righteousness. And that's a lot of righteousness. Verse number six, even as David also. So now, you know, that was talking about Abraham. Abraham believed God. It was imputed unto him righteousness. Verse number six, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Oh, there we go. But David lived in the time of Moses. Didn't they have to obey the law of Moses in order to be saved and go to heaven? Nope. David spake of it. He says, Blessed is the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. It's always been the same, but I don't, I don't want to get too far into that because that's a whole other sermon. I've preached that before, how salvation has always been by grace through faith. Romans 4 is a great chapter that, that recognizes that and also a great chapter that defines grace and separates grace from works. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. I need to hurry up. I might even just have to skip through some of this. I have a lot of material. I said this story, but I'm going kind of slow. Galatians chapter 2. Look at verse number 16. The Bible says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And see, people will try to, to, to package their work salvation in different ways. It, 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 it's usually very subtle. Because there's so many scriptures like this, and we've already read a bunch, that are very clear. It's not of works. It's completely by grace. And, and so you cannot deny this. So what people will do is say, okay, well, yeah, 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 it's, it's completely free. It's completely free. But if you're not, afterwards, after you receive the free gift, if you're not doing what's right, then you never got saved. And that's what people will say. And, and what's that doing? It's saying, well, now you have to be doing the good works in order to prove that you're saved. And it's like, the Bible never says that. Now, do you have a new spirit that's born again, that lives inside of you, a new creature? Absolutely. Is that Holy Spirit going to convict you of sin? Yes. But doesn't the Bible also say in our Bible memory passage, quench not the spirit? I can tell you for a fact that as a saved believer in the Lord Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit residing inside of you, we still sin. And not only do we still sin, but it's possible to quench the Spirit, to, to, to ignore what the Spirit's trying to lead you and show you. Because I'll tell you what, God doesn't make you into a robot and make you do good things all the time. You are allowed to make your choices. You can, you can ignore the, the, the prompting of the Holy Spirit and go off and get into sin and act just like everybody else and look unsaved to anybody watching you. And you know what? That's a shame. And God forbid that that happens, but that does not mean, well, you never really received the free gift because you go out and do sinful things. That's not what the Bible says. Oh, look, I don't frustrate 
the grace of God. I'm not going to frustrate and, and try to introduce in some way, fashion, you, you have to have these works or else you're never saved or, or, or try to repackage this and say, see, well, you're going to have to... Look, the Bible talks about being born again. Great example. It's a great illustration. John chapter 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you know, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Yeah, you have to be born. You have to become a child of God by believing on Jesus Christ. Now, as we read, I think it was last week I preached on this, you know, in a great house, there are vessels unto honor and vessels unto dishonor. In, in a big family, family have a lot of children, sometimes you're going to have some children that, that start doing some bad things. And, and rebellious children, and they start doing, you know. But aren't they still born into that family? Don't they still have that father and that mother that they were born to, that loved them? Now, they may need a lot of disciplining and a lot of correcting, but that, no, that does not mean they are no longer part of the family because they're a bad child. When you're born into God's family, you are in his family no matter what. It's not, you know, they're, they're, you, you, know you can choose to disobey his rules for you. My children can disobey my rules. Now, there's consequences for those. And look, the, 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 you know, this idea of cheap grace, look, just because we say that you're not going to go to hell doesn't mean that there are zero consequences for our actions. No, absolutely there's consequences. Absolutely, when we become a child of God, He will be disciplining us when we start getting into sin and when we start doing wrong. I'm not saying that you could just get off scot-free for everything that you do just because you put your faith in Christ. No, that's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is that that punishment of hell is removed from the equation once you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Just like when my children are born into my family, I will discipline them, I will punish them as needed, but I will never open up my oven, put them in, lock the door, and put it on broil, and leave them in there forever. I won't do it because I love them. God will never do that to us. His children, those that have put his, their faith in Jesus Christ, will put them forever in the burning, fiery furnace because he loves us and we're his children. But does that mean he won't correct us? No, of course he will. God has control over so many things and he can cause things to happen in our life but those things he does is because he loves us. He wants us to do what's right. He's trying to get our attention. It's different than the punishment of hell. And that's, and that's, what, that's what we believe and that's what we teach. So I, don't, you know, I, I try not to give people the impression that yeah, just go off and do anything you want as if it's no big deal because it is a big deal. But at the same time, I'm not going to make them think that, well, if I get into sin, I'm going to lose my salvation. Because that's not true. It's called eternal life. It's called everlasting life. If I were able to lose my salvation, how is that eternal? Let's say I'm saved today because I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I am saved. I have eternal life. If that word truly means forever, but then God sends me to hell, is that eternal life? I would call that temporary life. I would say, well, it only lasted a short time. I had temporary life. No, it's eternal life. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and then leading into chapter 6 is, is a great illustration. Great, not just illustration, great scripture regarding this very subject of being justified by faith through grace, or by grace through faith, Receiving that free gift, but then what about those that sin? This, the Romans 5 and 6 cover this completely. Look at uh, verse number 1 of Romans 5. The Bible reads, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So right off the bat, he's talking about being justified by our faith. We have access to God's grace by this faith. It's all by faith. Jump down to verse number 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, what I love about that verse is saying, being now justified, present tense, being now justified by his blood. We are right now justified because we have faith in him. We shall be saved from wrath through him. We're justified right now, and we know that in the future we're going to be saved from the wrath of hell because we're justified right now. Not, no, without even knowing what they're going to do with the rest of their life, what sins they might commit, we shall be saved. And it's, that's a confident saying, we shall be. It's, it's, the word shall, is, it's, um, 
you know, we use the word will differently than, than the way that the English language normally intended it to be, that there was the, de the definition of the word. Like, will is basically what you want. You know, someone makes a last will. It's, it's their last wishes. This is what I want to happen. And, and keep that in mind, too, when you read your Bible. When you see the words will, it's, it's always meaning, you know, I, 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 it's, it's their will. It's something they want to happen. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God, it's what God desires. He wants everybody to be saved, but he's, he's not controlling us and forcing us to be saved. He, but he, that's what his desire is. He wants us all to be saved. But this word shall is, is the best way to explain it is the way that we would use the word will. <laughs> right? I will be going to this place tomorrow. And, and the way that we use the word is I am going to this place tomorrow. And, and the word shall is that same definitive statement saying, you know, we shall be saved. This, this is going to happen. It's just a future tense of something that will happen, is going to happen. Now, I keep trying to catch myself now because I get caught up in, in using the word will uh, in, in today's vernacular. But um, it's a great verse. He's saying we're now justified, but we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more... Being reconciled, again, present tense, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. The atonement is the covering, the payment for their sins. We have now received that atonement. Verse number 12, and it explains now going the sin of Adam coming upon all men. We'll read this real quickly. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. And I have that underlined, free gift. It's completely free. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. God's grace, his atonement, his free gift has covered many. Verse 16, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the, free, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one the condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. See, the free gift that's given is, is of many offenses unto justification. Many, I mean, it's, it's <coughs> probably innumerable. The amount of offenses that grace covers. And, and he's, he's explaining this. Verse, let's keep reading here. Verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. So it only took Adam, Adam's fall and in his sin to bring sin into the world. We've all become sinners. And now, you know, real briefly, and I've reached a sermon around this. I don't believe that just that we are responsible for Adam's sin that God held Adam responsible for his sin, but he brought forth this sinful nature. He got him kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and now we all have a sinful nature that, that we all have our own sins. And the Bible even says here, you know, they didn't sin after, after the, same, the similitude of Adam's transgression. They didn't eat of the, of the fruit, tree, uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil because they were kicked out of Eden. They couldn't have done that. They didn't do the same sin that Adam did, but they had their own sins. They, they, they broke God's commandments in other ways. They, they did other things that were sinful. But we've all done that. And every, just you and I, we, you know, we all have our own sins that we've done. They may not be identical to each other because we've lived different lives. But we're all, um, you know, by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. The sin that abounded through Adam's transgression now is explaining is all covered by the grace of Jesus Christ because of that, what, what one man did to, to, to defeat what Adam did, to defeat the sin that was brought into the world. The one thing that, you know, the thing that Jesus Christ did covers all of that. Verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now, the obedience of one is not your obedience. That's the obedience of Jesus Christ. 
that paid for our sins because he was righteous. Look, we're already disobedient. We have no more hopes of being completely 100% obedient to God because we've already screwed that up. But Jesus Christ was without sin. He was completely obedient in every single way, shape, and form, which is why he was worthy of being the propitiation for our sins. Verse number 20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, so when sin is just, is just getting more and more and abounding, he says, grace did much more abound. Grace covers a sin even much more than however much sin abounds in this world or how much sin there is, grace abounds even more and is able to cover all of that sin. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So this is literally saying that no matter how much sin there is, grace abounds even more than that. But the question is then, okay, well then if, if grace is going to abound, then why don't I just keep sinning? Because, hey, God's grace is going to cover it all. Well, that's where Romans 6 comes in. Let's keep reading. You know? Let's not stop at Romans 5 and say, I'm done, and say, cool, grace is going to abound. Let's read Romans 6. Verse 1, Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's the question, right? Should we? Should we just keep sinning then? Because, hey, grace is going to abound. And that's what that question implies. Well, grace will abound. Verse 2, God forbid. God forbid we should go out and continue in sin. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And notice that he says, should walk. Just, as Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead, and we're baptized with him in the death, and, and you know, we should now be living that glorified life, the, 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 the life that's reflected in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we should be doing. But does that say that even so we also automatically will walk in newness of life because we've been saved? Or does that say that we must walk in newness of life in order to stay saved? It doesn't say that. We should. And absolutely we should because of the great gift that he's given to us. We should walk in newness of life. For if, verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. There's that word shall. This is going to happen. In the likeness of his resurrection, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We shouldn't serve sin anymore. But again, there's, there's a, you know, paying close attention to these words is critical for understanding the Bible. We need to look at every word and understand the importance of the words. And when we, when we, when we read the, the context and the syntax of the words to understand that just because you're saved doesn't mean you're automatically going to be doing good, but it's still telling us that we should. Jesus Christ said, you remember the woman that was taken in adultery? And he said, let, let him that is uh, without sin among you cast the first stone. Right? And, and then they all left. They all were convicted. They, everybody went away. And he says, you know, hath no man condemned thee? Talking to the woman. And she said, no man. And he said, neither do I condemn thee. And then he said, go and sin no more. Now, he showed mercy and he showed grace unto her. Right? She was, apparently, she was worthy of death. She was, she was guilty of adultery. He said they caught her in the act. Now, if, if what they were saying was true, we don't know for sure, but assuming it was true, he, shows, he extends mercy and grace unto her, which is what he came in the world to do, was to, was to extend mercy and grace. When he comes back again, he's going to be coming back to judge. But the first time he came, it was all to give his life a ransom for many. But he said, go and sin no more. But he didn't say... And if you do, then you're not going to be saved. He just, he's saying, go and sin no more. And, you know, it's, that is, of course, we should sin no more. And that is what we strive for. You know, and, and I try to preach in a way where, where you know, uh, it's not pleasant to hear all the time because it may be something that you're guilty of doing. But look, we need to get the sin out of our life. But it has nothing to do with whether or not we're still saved. It has to do with being an obedient child to God so that we can be blessed by him. That is the point. That is the purpose, to show God our love for him. If my children want to show me how much they love me and respect me, they're going to listen to what I say and obey my commandments. And it's as simple as that. And the more they do that, the more I do bless them, and the more likely when they come to me and ask me for stuff, 
I'll, I'll be willing to give it to them because they're being good children. Now, I would argue that those that want to add works to salvation, the ones that call the true gospel cheap grace, they're the ones that's making it cheap. They're the ones that is bringing down grace. See, I exalt grace. I think it's great. I think how amazing is it that even though I've done so many wicked sins and so much against God, that God is still willing to love me and give me a free gift and wipe the slate clean and say, all of your sins are covered. All of them. That is amazing and just shows the, the level of love that God has for us. But those that try to add the works in, I say they're cheapening the grace of God. And let me, let me put it to you this way. Let's, I'm going to come up with an example here. I've got, I've got a, a little bit of an outline here. Think about someone, someone that you know getting all excited and coming to you because they've got a great gift for you. And their gift for you is a multi-million dollar mansion, this great property, everything. I mean, the, the heaven on earth, right? This place where all of your needs are going to be met. You're going to have servants. You're going to have all this stuff. You can do whatever you want with your time and live in a place with a pool and a great bed and, you know, and all this abundance of food. Oh, the great place, right? And he's saying, I want you to have this gift. It's for you. I've got this great gift and I want you to have it. But then you go and you think, you know what? Man, I don't even know if I can accept this gift. I mean, what do you do? It's so expensive. It's so pricey. How can I do this? And you start to feel bad and say, you know what? I realize that the, that the value of this gift is so immense, but I can't just accept this free gift. So I've, I'm going to have to give you something for this gift. And, and, and well, all I have is $100. Here you go. Now... The person who's giving you all of that, what is $100? It's an insult. It's cheapening. What are you, you, say, you think you're going to help in any way by giving me $100 towards all of this that I'm giving you? Are you crazy? I don't want your $100. You know, I used to work in, in the service industry. You know, people would, you know, I'd do all this work. I'd try to make their food for them really well and all this other stuff, and they'd leave a tip of like a nickel. And, and they, they'd say, oh, man, this was great. This is the best sandwich I've ever had and all this other stuff. And their change was six cents and they'd leave six cents. And it's like, you know what? Keep your six cents because that's an insult. Honestly, it is. It, you know, when, you're, when you're doing this work for people and you're serving them, you're putting everything into it. And then they comment and say, this was great. And they've had all their needs met. Their drinks were filled. Everything was done the way, you know, the way that, that, that would be good service. And then they leave you six cents. That's, that's an insult. It's the same way for someone, you know, trying to give you a mansion. You just want to give them, you know, $5 or $100 or whatever. It's an insult. That's the way that God looks at us. If we're going to say, you know, God, this, this great gift is of, of eternal life and this home in heaven, this mansion in heaven that you are giving to us for free. But I have to, I have to do something good. I have, to, I have to add my works to it. That's cheapening the present, the gift that God has given to you. It's an insult. We have to humbly accept that gift. The Bible says that uh, in Isaiah 64, 6, you don't have to turn there. It says, but, all, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. In the sight of God, no matter how hard we try, and you know, you, you know, I'm not saying not to do good things, but our good works and our efforts in the sight of the holy God, the perfect God who does nothing wrong, he looks at our good works, and you know what? They're dirty. They're dirty rags. It's not quite as good as we think they are. In trying to add those dirty rags to the price of your, to, as in some form of payment for the price of our free gift, that cheapens God's grace. That is truly the cheap grace. I believe in free grace and completely a gift because God loves us. He wants us to be saved. He did all the work for us. And all he's asking is just, just to believe him. Just believe me. This is what I did for you. Believe it. Believe it. That's it. All right, what am I going to cut out? Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 1. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm cutting some more verses out of here. 
There's so much content on this subject. I mean, literally, we could go on for days on the, the grace of God. But the reason why this is so important and, and to know these references and to know these verses and, and to be strong and to be solid on the grace of God and how free our salvation is and that, and that it's eternal life and it's given to us and all you have to do is receive Christ and put your faith on Him to be saved and you have eternal life is because of what Galatians says about there being many deceivers. There are people who are trying to to tell you that no, that is not salvation. No, it's not by grace. No, you have to do something else. You know, the, the Mormons will tell you, you know, like, oh, look at James chapter 2. It says, you know, faith without works is dead. See, that means you have to do work in order to, in order to be saved and all this other stuff. Look, it's a false gospel. Galatians chapter 1, look at verse number 6. This is the Apostle Paul writing unto the church in Galatia, unto the Galatians here, and explaining to them, He's saying, you know, there's, there's, there's been deceivers. There's people trying to trick him. Verse number six, he says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He's saying, what are you doing? Why are you being, being removed unto, unto another gospel? He says in verse seven, look at this though. It says, which is not another. So they're not preaching like salvation through Buddha. It's not a whole nother thing. He says, it's not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So what they're doing is saying, yeah, it's Jesus Christ, and, 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 you know, and, and try to wrap everything up in the Bible and God's word and the Lord and Jesus, but they're perverting it. It's a twisting. It, it's taking it and changing the truth of God into a lie. And that's the most subtle way to deceive anybody. You have to include a lot of, of truth in order to, to trick people, in order to get them to buy into what it is that you're selling but then you twist something and turn it into a lie to deceive them. And, th and this is what's been, been done all throughout history. Verse number eight, very strong words. But though we, or an angel from heaven, even if an angel from heaven appears unto you, he says, and preach any other gospel unto you than that which you, we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Even if we do it, he's saying, even if I come to you and start to preach a different gospel unto you, an angel from heaven comes down and preaches a different He says, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. Because that's not the gospel of God. Verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Strong words. Why? Because there's deceivers. Because there are people perverting the gospel of Christ. There are people saying, no, 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 no. Faith isn't enough. No, 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 no. Are you kidding me? Yeah, of course. If faith was enough, then everybody would be saved. But you know what? That's not true. And anybody who goes out, if you, if you think that just, just all these different Christian denominations, all these other people are all just saved because they might say that they believe in Christ, come out soul winning with me and you'll see. And the reason why I say that, and look, when I was newly saved, I thought that a lot of people were saved. I thought that there was a whole bunch of people that are saved out there. Because it's so easy. Because you're thinking, like, man, they said, well, yeah, I mean, all these people, they all, they all claim to believe in Christ. But here's the key. When you start asking them what they believe, they'll say they believe in Christ, but they don't believe that that's it. For example, uh, uh, you know, Pentecostals believe you have to be baptized. Now, I know there's like different, there's different uh, the variations of, 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 their, of their faith, but like they'll believe either you, could, you, could, you have to be baptized also to be saved, which if you believe you have to add any work into, self, into the grace of God, you're not saved. And I have no, no problem saying that because the salvation is completely by grace alone. Once you start adding in something to grace, it's not grace. You're not believing in grace anymore. That is not your faith. Your faith is in works. Grace and works are inseparable. And when you start adding works, it's works. When you say, well, no, you also have to be baptized. You also have to confess your sins. You also have to go to church. You also have to pay tithes. You also have to do this. That's works. And you're not saved because you're not believing only in, the, in Jesus Christ. You're not, you do not receive grace. You are adding works to it, and, I, and those people aren't saved. And when you go out soul winning with us, you'll realize, because we, 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 we tend to ask probing questions and, and really get down to the heart. The heart. People can repeat anything. It doesn't mean that's actually what they believe. People oftentimes will just repeat things that they've heard. Honestly. And, and, and I get it. You know, pastors all across the, the country in Christian churches will be saying salvation is by grace through faith. And you hear that over and over and over again, that people will repeat that answer, salvation is by grace through faith. But I like to ask the questions then and say, okay, well, if salvation is by grace through faith, and to give an example, 
What, what, what would happen? Let's just say you have a person, they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ when they're 20 years old. Is that person saved? I mean, it's, they receive a free gift, right? Oh, yeah, 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 they're saved. Okay, 10 years later, same person, let's say they go out and they, and they commit a murder. Then they kill themselves. Are they going to heaven or hell? It's really bad sins. The heart, their understanding of salvation, just, just, just knowing, is it truly by grace, by faith, or do they believe, well, I mean, you can't murder somebody. That will reveal what a person believes. Those types of questioning, because then when someone says, well, of course they're going to hell. Well, why? They believed in Christ. If it's by grace, if it's a free gift, if it's eternal life, then they're, they're still saved. I say they're saved. Now, is that something they should do? Of course not. Is that something God wants them to do or told them to do? No. But they're still saved because Christ paid for all their sins. They've received a free gift. It's not based on their obedience to the law. It's not based on their works. But those are the types of questions that will reveal what a person believes in their heart. Because what you believe in your heart is what matters. Not just what you can repeat someone else say. The faith is the faith comes from inside of you. The faith is where your where your belief is in your heart. I'll read well, one more one more place and we're done. Matthew chapter seven. I just want to expose one one real common chapter that's used for people who want to justify a works based salvation. And I so I kind of want to explain this real quickly. I'm not gonna take too much time. Matthew chapter seven is a very common place. In Scripture, that people will will misuse and try to and try to explain why you need to do works in order to be saved. And there's many other places in the Bible that 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 might be a little bit confusing or hard to understand for some people that they'll turn to as well. James two again, you know, it's a real common one. I'm not going to go over that this morning. Um, it, it can be difficult, and that was a chapter that was difficult for me to understand for a while too. I'll be honest. But the reason why it was difficult to understand is because you have people coming at you with a false doctrine already, and you're looking at it through that lens instead of just just trying to look at it and understand what it's really saying. But um, Matthew seven, look at uh, verse number twenty one. This is a place I've had people will turn to me. And look, it's funny because I have this ver these verses highlighted in my Bible because, and, and, and I love it when people ask me to go there to try to prove workspace salvation because I use it to prove the exact opposite because it does prove the exact opposite. But, it, but you know, when, when someone's talking to you, sometimes it can be easy, you know, if you're not too solid, it can be easy to be deceived. You start looking at it the way that they're looking at it instead of getting the whole thing in context. But let, let's, re let's read it. Okay, Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So right there, you'd be like, boom, right there. See, you have to do God's will. You have to do what's right. You have to do good things. You have to do all this stuff. And if we stop there, yeah, you could be like, oh man, well, what's that saying? And if, if, that's, if that's all that meant, then we got a contradiction. Because this says that we have to do good works. Jesus just said we had to be born again. You know, when this is Jesus speaking here too, by the way, then Jesus contradicted himself and saying, well, wait a minute. Doesn't that up? But that's not what he's saying. Look, we've got to, let's keep reading. <laughs> let's keep going. He says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And they'll say, see, see, faith isn't enough. And I'll say, wait a minute. What event is happening here? It's talking about getting into heaven. Now, what are these people saying in order to get into heaven? They're saying, many will say to me in that day, verse 22, have we not prophesied in thy name? God, I went out and I preached unto people in your name. I did that work. I worked for you. I, I was preaching to people about you. God, I've cast out devils. I've done this work for you. And in thy name have done many wonderful works. What are they trusting in to get into heaven? Their works. They're trusting in all the things that they did for God and all the works that they've done. And they're expecting to get ad admission into heaven because they've done so many good things. And as they see, look, this is what this is he's teaching here. 
Many, yes, many people right now literally think that they're living such a good life that they are going to go to heaven when they die because they're doing so much for God. And they're deceived. And he's explaining that that's not going to happen because he, when they come to him and say that, he's going to say, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Because they're sinners. They didn't receive grace. They didn't receive the free gift. And look at what he says. I never knew you. Now these, these people who think you could lose your salvation, or these people who think that you have to do good works, they say, yes, it's grace by faith, but then you also have to do this other good stuff. If that were true, and if this is talking about people who received Christ, but then they weren't doing good works, or they weren't good enough, and they weren't obeying the will of God to get into heaven, then he couldn't say, I never knew you. He would have to say, I used to know you. At one point, I knew you when you got saved, but now I don't know you anymore. No, he says, I never knew you. Because they never got saved. They never put their faith in Jesus Christ. They never became a child of God. And that's why, that's why I have these verses highlighted. But the, you know, people over and over again, they're deceived. And why? Because of the John MacArthur's, because of the, 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 the Paul Washer's, these people who are teaching this lordship salvation, that are teaching you you have to do the works, you have to do all this other stuff and make Jesus the Lord of your life. They'll twist these scriptures and try to make you think that, oh yeah, see, and... and this is why you got to read your Bible, though, folks, because when you don't know the word and you, don't even, you can't even see the contradiction there because of all of the other verses that the Bible talks about, you're a lot easier to be deceived. And, you know, the people of Berea were more noble because they searched the scriptures daily, whether the things that the Apostle Paul was saying unto them were true. And I encourage you, search your scripture daily. That's why I have the notes section on the back of the bulletin. Hey, write down this stuff and verify if what I'm saying to you is true. I don't expect you just to believe it because I'm saying it. Just say, oh, well, the pastor said this, so it must be true. No, look, read it for yourself. I can tell you all day long how sincere and honest I am and how much I'm not deceiving you. But ultimately, at the end of the day, God is going to hold you responsible. So if I'm wrong about something... Even if I'm sincere about it, you're still responsible for what you believe. And that's the truth. And look, there are, there are people who are sincere that are in false religions. And they're very sincere. But the sincerity doesn't cut it. Because if what they're saying is not true, it's not true. And we need to search the Scripture daily whether these things be so. Since we're in Matthew 7, I'm just going to point out one more thing in regard to the works. We say, well, if you're not doing the good works, then you must not be saved. Right? And they'll say, look at verse number 20. They'll, they'll use this verse right before we got started. It says, wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. So they'll say, see, a Christian's going to bring forth good fruits, and, and if you're not saved, then you're not going to bring forth good fruits. And that's how they apply this verse. And they'll say, by their fruits you shall know them. But again, context is everything. What is this verse even talking about? Let's go up a little bit further in the passage and read what Jesus is talking about. Verse number 15 will get the context of this particular passage in Matthew 7. Jesus is warning him in verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And read the rest of that passage. You say, see, a good tree bringeth forth good fruit, and a corrupt tree bringeth forth corrupt evil fruit. But he's talking about false prophets. He's not talking about your average Christian. What's a false prophet? A prophet is someone who's a teacher. They're a preacher. They're, they're a false prophet. They're preaching a false gospel, a false message, and they're a leader in some sort of you know, congregation or whatever, and they're coming out and saying these false things. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. Outwardly they look good, Inwardly, they're ravening wolves. And he's saying what ultimately will come out of them is their fruit, and that's how you're going to know. Because on the outside, they're going to look just like one of you. They're going to look like they're a great person. They're going to look like a Pharisee. Right? They're going to look like they're real holy and righteous, and that's how the people regarded the Pharisees. Oh, wow, these men of God, they're all holy and righteous and everything else. But no, Jesus called them out because they weren't. Inwardly, they were, they, were, they, were, they were wolves. And that's how, but, but this is how you judge the false prophet. By their fruits, you shall know them. It doesn't say judge every single person you meet by their fruits. No, the false prophet. And look, there are a few other places in Scripture that will refer to the same thing, by their fruits, you shall know them. Look up every single one. 
and it's always talking about this. It's talking about the false prophets and the false teachers. That's how you know them. So to say, to apply this verse and say every single Christian much must be bringing forth good fruit in order to know them, is not true. You cannot take it to that end because you think about just fruit in general. Fruit, an apple, if it's planted, the seeds that come from an apple is going to bring forth an apple tree, right? That apple tree needs to grow in order to produce, you know, sometimes it's still growing, still growing. It doesn't always produce fruit. We have apple tree, an apple tree in our front yard that's not producing any fruit. Does that mean it's not an apple tree? Just because it's not producing fruit? No. But if I didn't know what type of tree it was and if I couldn't tell by the leaves and it just said, well, that's a tree, the only way I'm going to know what kind of tree it is is once it starts to bring forth fruit. But prior to that, I have no idea what kind of tree it is. It doesn't make it no longer an apple tree because it's not bringing forth apples. But if it starts bringing forth oranges, I'll tell you what, it's not an apple tree. <laughs> I know that. It could claim, all day. you could put a, a tag on it and a big banner and a sign saying this is an apple tree, right? But if it starts bringing forth oranges, we know it's not an apple tree. It's an orange tree. So that's what that's saying. You know, and when you look at Christians, hey, some people aren't bringing forth any fruit. Let's be honest. Some people aren't doing anything for God, but it doesn't mean that they're not saved. It doesn't mean they didn't receive a free gift. It doesn't mean they didn't get converted. It just means that they're not bringing forth fruit. Now, if they start bringing forth bad fruit and start converting people into false doctrine and false religion and, you know, and, and, and leading people astray, then I would say, yeah, they're not saved. They don't, you know, they're, they're, they're bringing forth evil fruit. They're bringing forth bad fruit and, and, and leading people in a false gospel. That is not someone who's saved. But until someone actually starts producing and where you can see the fruit, you won't, you won't know. There's just no way of knowing. So that's why, you know, and, and I'll use myself, and, and I know this. I know this for a fact. You may not know this, but I know this. I got saved when I was 20 years old. I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? I was born again. I know I was born again. I know I was saved. I know I had eternal life. But I didn't go to church. I didn't get involved. I didn't, I, you know, for a little while, I was, I was kind of excited about it, and I started reading the Bible. But you know what? That faded off a little bit. And I liked the sins that I was doing more than I liked serving God. It's a shame to say that, but it's the truth. But because I liked that, does that mean I just wasn't saved then? No. It was a free gift and I received it. Now, of course, things change. You know, God, and God disciplined me. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I'm not even going to get into all that. God had to correct me. Because he is my father and I am his son and I was being disobedient and I needed correction and I needed some serious correction and it took a couple years of correcting. <laughs> but, but he finally got a hold of me and got me in the right place. And, but, it, but none of that means, and if, if anyone would have looked at me during, during my early 20s, you wouldn't have been like, oh yeah, there's a Christian guy. Oh yeah, there's somebody that loves God. Nope. Not for a second. I didn't look like a Christian. But you know what? On the inside, I had the Holy Spirit. I still, even though I was trying to quench that spirit, I was saved. I was born again. And we need to keep that in mind. You know, don't let people try to make you doubt of your own salvation just because you don't, you know, you don't look to them like someone who's a Christian. Now, it's a shame that, you know, we all ought to be someone that says, hey, here's a good example of a Christian man or a Christian lady. That's what we ought to be. That's what we should be doing. We should be walking in newness of life. We should live righteous lives. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for the, for the grace that you've bestowed upon us, dear Lord. That amazing grace, that, that free gift of eternal life, of salvation, dear Lord. It truly is amazing, God. We love you. I love you so much and thank you for that great gift. We are completely undeserving of it, yet you still cared enough for us to, to give your only begotten Son, dear Lord, to pay for our sins. What an amazing gift. God, help us to, to not be deceived by the deceivers out there that pervert your gospel. Help us to, to stay true. And Lord, help us not to sin. Help us to, to, to be children that bring you honor and that you can be pleased with and that you can bless, dear Lord, because we love you and we want to serve you, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just help this church to grow. Help us to reach people in the community and to, and to preach the gospel to every creature as you've commanded us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.